Well, hello there, dangerous woman. I <laughs> am here <laughs> with one of the dangerous women in the world. <laughs> I'm totally taking that title on now. I'm just Attaway, dangerous woman. I love it. I am with Desiree Attaway. Bam, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you, Desiree. And I would love for you to introduce yourself to our Dangerous Woman tribe, please. Sure. I'm Desiree Attaway. I am a um, consultant and a coach and education educator facilitator. Um, I have over 25 years experience creating and leading and managing um, teams um, within institutions. And the work that I do comes from a very distinct framework of understanding that inequity and whether that's racial or otherwise is really a result of um, systems and institutions and cumulative disadvantage that have been built into social institutions. That it is actually not about people being nice or kind or good, but it's actually um, uh, based upon laws and policies and everyday practices that um, and power and how power is used and shared and so I work from an intersectional perspective that believes that institutions and organizations thrive when they build cultures that are inclusive and that's a wide range right ethnic racial gender sexual religious national identities and abilities. And so we create better communities, stronger communities, and ultimately better products when we have all the voices at the table. Right, absolutely. So. Awesome, well thank you for your work and thank you for being here. I am I'm so thankful. So I would love to hear, wow. <laughs> what do you think it means to be a dangerous woman in the world today? I think any woman that actually uses her voice and speaks up is considered a dangerous woman, right? Because we've been socialized mm -hmm. to be small and to edit, right? Uh, we've been socialized to edit what goes in our mouths and what comes out of our mouths right. Right. on all the levels. And so any woman that dares to not edit herself, um, that dares to say, to call the thing the thing, that dares to be free um, within her physical form and her spiritual form, I think society considers to be dangerous. Beautiful, yes. So, I'd love to know, when did, you, when did you see a dangerous woman in your life who inspired you to become more, you know, to become more free in your own voice um, and to kind of compelled you to stand in who you are? Well, I guess that would probably, you know, I come from a long line of, of really powerful women. So I saw my mom and my grandma and all my aunties, and they were, you know, they all just were working and were, um, and not super professional, like they were all laborers, but just were really strong, um, loving women who took care of each other and who took care of us. And then um, as I went off to college and I began to read and study, I started reading, um, you know, from women's study courses and critical race theory courses. I would start reading Audre Lorde and, um, you know, I would read about Ashana Sakur and I would just read about these women who, who who spoke up and spoke out, right? And, 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 and spoke publicly, which women are taught not to have a voice publicly, right? I may think something and I may share it over here in private with a few people, but to really kind of take a stand and speak publicly on, um, on issues that are critical to our well being and our growth. And um, I thought it was amazing. So th those were the first, you know, Toni Morrison, these were the dangerous women who said, I don't need a male gaze for me to do what I need to do. I don't need a white gaze for me to do what I do. 
right? That as I am in this entity is enough for me to show up and do the work that needs to be done. And so that's when I learned that there were really dangerous women out there that folks did not want to survive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, those are some wonderful, dangerous voices. That inspire, <laughs> still, you know, inspire me so much as well. Yeah. When did you discover, or really kind of felt like, oh, this is a moment when I'm owning my power? Um, I think where I, where I, where my voice became consistent, mm -hmm. um, was probably four years ago before. Clients that I work with are active. So, you know, in my 20s, I was out protesting, you know. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I was, you know, wearing the Doc Martin boots and I was out. It's okay. We just had a, sorry, we just had a moment there. Can you, I just, so you said how many years ago, I just missed that. Okay, about, uh, you know, in my 20s, right? Like I was the person out protesting and in the streets and doing the things and then I had children and and so that evolved and so about three four years ago I found a lot of my clients were actually activists mm -hmm. and so I was I've been providing a lot of support to them in the background around strategy and, and self-care and helping them think through um like just helping them work through all of these very complex issues. Right. And it was, I don't know, I think something around being with them and watching their bravery and seeing this anti-blackness that just was arising around the world, more so than normal. Right. Whereas you knew these things were there, they became bolder and more in your face. And I remember when Trayvon Martin who had been murdered, when um, the jury came back and found his killer not guilty. And at that point, my daughter was 22. And she called me bawling over the phone because she she thought of course he's going to be found guilty and i just remember you know crying with her on the phone and saying to her that's not how the justice system works and as a mother it was the most heartbreaking moment of my life to tell my daughter no that's actually not how it works. Um, and that this man was going to be set free. So I think at that point in time, I made a, I think it was an unconscious decision, but I made a decision that my daughter's life would matter. Um, and that I was going to make sure of that. Um, so yeah, I think that's when my voice became clearer and more consistent and more public around a lot of issues. Yeah. I remember, I remember seeing kind of a shift, right? <clears throat> and cause I've been following you for a long time. Yeah. We've been connected for a long time. Yeah, I know, but it was just a shift. And I think that, I think history com compelled that right as well, right? Like the, the history right now is asking that. For women to rise well for for everybody to rise and to speak. absolutely yes. we, we there are no more there are no sidelines yeah no so there's no i'm gonna stand on i'm gonna stand on the sideline and wait there are no sidelines we their history mm -hmm. is compelling us right. to choose a side and to be vocal and clear about what that is mm -hmm. and so we get to say i'm choosing love i'm choosing humanity I'm choosing equality. I'm choosing inclusion. I'm choosing, I'm, a, I'm choosing equity. I'm choosing community. 
or we get to choose all the opposite of that, which are fear and hate and shame and regret and guilt and pain. And it has consequences down the generations, right? So, uh, Absolutely. Okay. You said in your blog, you said there is no sideline when the price for silence is a human dignity or a human life. Right. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what silence, what that silence means to you. So, um, I'm a big believer. Uh, Audrey Lord is her writings um, have profoundly shaped who I am as an adult woman. And her, uh, the book, Sister Outsider, Essays and Speeches, is one I recommend to everyone. Anybody that works with me, I give them that book as a gift. I mean, like, I, I, every, I'm like, it's coming. I, I, I should own stock because I, I, send, I must buy hundreds of copies a year. But um, what Audre Lorde has, in her writings, has taught me is silence never protects us. And we think it does, right? And I'm just going to sit over here and I'm going to be quiet and small and nobody will notice. But we pay a price. Those who are oppressed pay a price and those who are doing the oppression, either intentionally or not, are paying a price. We pay a price with our spirit, with our souls. We give, there's so much of ourselves that dies when we sit and watch other people be subjugated. And so that silence does not protect us. And it, it never has, and it never will. And that's the lie that we've been told to keep us in line. Right. Absolutely. Have you, has there been a moment when somebody has been silent in your life when you wished they would have spoken up? Oh yeah, you know, within, um, you know, I see people who make the decision, right? Like, I'm not going to speak up because that could, you know, and I get it, right? Like, I have to keep my job or um, we punish people for going against the status quo in society. We're really intentional about that, right? If you don't fall in a line within a, in the church, <laughs> right? You, some people, they'll push you away. Mm -hmm. um, within work, right? You're the person that constantly brings up the issues and you're the scapegoat, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we created systems so that you don't do that, right? Within our family, right? Um, don't bring that up at the dinner table or over Thanksgiving because don't do it, right? We just want to get through this day. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? What's the worst thing that's going to happen if you don't speak up? You know what? The worst thing that was going to happen to me if I didn't speak up was maybe I lost some clients. Okay, I can always go out and get a job. But who I was and how I chose to live my life, the teachings, my spiritual you know, beliefs, my love, um, my heart would not allow me to watch someone else um, be oppressed when I can say or do something about it. So when Sandra Bland was pulled out of that car and was thrown into jail, literally just for not being afraid of this cop. I, I, I remember, um, once the video came out, sending a text to a friend of mine who'd done a lot of work in South Africa. And I said, that was some apartheid stuff that just happened right there. People disappearing out of cars, literally, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I was like, we've seen this happen mm -hmm. in history. Right. This does not end well. And she was the same age as my kid, again, that could have been my daughter pulled over and disappeared. And I never forget that. And, and, and the effects of that are still with me today. Every time I have to drive someplace, I ask myself, do I want to drive? Or is it easier to jump in a Lyft or an Uber? 
do I want to deal with the police mm -hmm. as I navigate my world as a black woman? And these are the questions I ask myself. So being quiet <laughs> serves no one because they're, they're members of your community who are literally being taught to, to not take up public space because of, of the fear of harm. I'm just sitting with, with your words and you know the impact of that, of having to ask yourself those questions every day, right? Yeah, I do. I ask myself all the time, do I, do I feel like driving? Do I want to deal with that if something happens? Yeah. Is it easier for me just to jump in a lift and go someplace? Yeah. Some days it is. Some days I, I don't want to. Are there other places, other questions that you have to ask yourself as well? Yeah, is it safe for me to be in this space? So since the election here, I live in a predominantly beautiful mountain, wonderful town in North Carolina in the mountains. And it's um, not a lot of, uh, of black or brown folks that live here. And those that do are pretty much hidden. You don't see a lot of faces like mine. And uh, I love, I, I don't like cities as I've gotten older. I don't enjoy them. I don't want to be in them. Um, but since the election, one of the questions I've asked myself is, can I still live here? Do I feel safe enough to live here? And I don't know if I do. And so part of what I'm struggling with is, do I move to a bigger city, right, where I am surrounded by more folks who look like me and where I could feel some physical safety. Um, and that I'm struggling with that right now. You know, do I, do I go to um, Chicago back where I was born and raised? Do I go to New York where I have friends? Do I go to these cities and change the quality of my life mm -hmm. simply because, and it's not, you know, just an easy question, but because I know that, um, I would feel a measure of physical safety that I don't feel right now. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I, I understand. Well, I own the privilege of not having to think about that right now and yeah. sit with that and to say that that's not okay with me. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are plenty of folks who, who, you know, depending on the identity and where they are, have to make that decision all the time right like is it safe yes. is it safe on all the levels for me to live here in this place at this time yeah okay so i was reading a document that you shared um someone on your facebook last night um on race on, on racism but one of there was a chart in there and one of the things it talked about is moving outside outside of racism towards liberation requires dissonance. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that's something that we have to get comfortable with if we want to be dangerous women, right? So I'd love for you to speak a little bit about this dissonance, because, yeah, you know, because you're, then you're, you're up, it's kind of like, you know, calling the question at the dinner table or, um, you know, being that, that voice that upsets things, right? So I'd love for you to speak a bit about that. So, you know, we've been socialized. You know, I tell people all the time, it's not like, we got here on accident. <laughs> we've been socialized to, to show up in certain ways. Right. And we've gotten rewards for showing up in certain ways. And we've been punished for showing up in certain ways. And so what happens is, right, you think about who your first teachers were, your parents, your grandparents, and all the things that they taught you about what does it mean to be a woman or what is it culturally and what schools have taught you and what the church have taught you and what um, media has taught you about what does it mean to be a woman and um and all and all the other identities that we navigate the world with right and then something happens dissonant we're all on facebook chatting about recipes and a video goes around where we literally see a man shot on Facebook Live by the police. 
or we see a man being choked out on the street saying, I can't breathe. We see these things, right? And now we have to make it, we have to deal with our dissonance around this, right? Because we've been taught only bad people go to jail and only these things, only these type of things happen to these type of people. So then we see something that goes against that, that says, oh, all these teachings and things that I was told was wrong, mm -hmm. right? Or people who are like, I'm good Christians, but then they do something that's super hateful to somebody else. And you're like, wait, that's not what I've been taught, mm -hmm. who we are and how we love and, right. and, and um, walk in the world. Right. So we have this dissonance. And at that point of dissonance, we get to make a choice. We can ignore the dissonance and just go right back on to the status quo because it's easy. Because again, we get, we get cookies and we get rewards, whether that is money or power or whatever that is. Or I can sit at the dinner table and I can say, I think it's really wrong and we really need to look at what's happening in this world. And I don't agree with you, dad, or I don't agree with you, grandpa, or using that language around me is really unacceptable. Or I expect better from members of my congregation around these issues. Because we're going to get pushback. And we've been taught that um we that being in conflict it feels like we're going to physically be hurt but we're not so we've been taught that comfort is a value mm -hmm. and that being comfortable is the most important thing in life and we equate happiness with comfort and we equate um joy with comfort and that we are never, not for one minute, supposed to not be comfortable. So we don't know how to sit in it. We don't know how to be with it. We don't know how to sit with nuance. We, we're really binary and it's either right or wrong or black or white or good or bad. Right? Yeah. So in these spaces, when we hit this dissonance, it hurts. And so what do we do when we're in pain? We go back to where we were when we weren't in pain. We want to, why do I want to sit in the pain? <laughs> the pain is where the growth happens. It's where that edge is. It's where the learning occurs, right? So when I teach courses or facilitate, people will always like, they really ask me all the time, like, will I be safe? And I say, no, you will not be. There will never be any physical harm that comes to you, but I can't guarantee you emotional safety. So I need you to be brave. Mm -hmm. What I'm gonna create is a brave space, not a safe space. Mm -hmm. And it's a space where we're gonna push each other to that learning edge, and we're gonna sit in that discomfort, and we're gonna name it, and we're gonna be with it, and we're gonna talk our way through it, and pray our way through it, and love our way through it, but we're going to be in it because that's where we're supposed to be to do this work. Okay. <clears throat> I so appreciate that. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, what is the change you would love to see in the world? Hmm. You know, if Gandhi tells us, be the change you want to see in the world. Like, what is the change you would love to see? Um, I, I want to see this binary thinking to go away. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I want us to understand that we live in spaces of nuance and um, of grays and that it's okay. And I want us to understand that 
our job, our work here on this earth is to make sure that the most vulnerable in our communities are protected and loved. And, are, and, and we center the building of systems around whoever the most vulnerable is. Because if they're taken care of, then you and I are perfectly fine with taking care of. So who is that most vulnerable in your community? It is our job. It is why we are here. If we're in real community, if we're in transformational community, right, it is right. our job to make sure that whoever the most vulnerable is, that they are protected and loved and cared for and defended. That's our work. And that kind of fits into another thing that you said on your blog, and it says, it's clear to me that it'll be marginalized folks that will fix the world's problems, right? Yeah. Yeah. The kind of that when, when we take care of the vulnerable and what we call um, the marginal, mm -hmm. that there would be there would be liberation for all of us. There would be freedom for all of us. Right? Because there will not be without that. There will never be. All of our liberations are are bound together. And that is that is the clearest thing on earth. And so, you know, whoever that vulnerable group is, the most marginalized. That's who we have to defend and care for. Okay, so where do you see some hope rising? In your <laughs> Someone asked me the other day, uh, I said, I'm hopeful every day. Yeah. I, I do. I, and it's, so, it's interesting because what I will not bring into my inner circle are people who are not optimistic. Mm -hmm. Every day I, I quote Asada Shakur. Um, it's our duty to fight. It's our duty to win. We must love and care for one another. We have nothing to lose but our chain. Mm -hmm. I believe that. I mean, it is my mantra. I say it every day. I believe that we will win. And actually, it won't happen in my lifetime. I won't see it. It won't happen in my children's lifetime. They will not see it. It took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for us to get here. Right. It will take hundreds of years for us to dismantle this. And I'm okay with that. I don't have to see it to know that I will gain the victory from it. Again, it won't be in my lifetime. But I'm not doing this work for just me. It's not just so that my life is easier, my life is happier. It's actually not what this is not about. So, we must love each other. And I can't love, how do I love you if I can't take care of you? If, if, if I know that there are parts of you that cannot shine and be open and live your incredibly best life. Yeah, how can I shine when you have to ask yourself, you know, you know is it safe for me to get in my car today, right? Like that's, yeah. It, I mean, it's a, my sister, Desiree. Right, right? I asked myself that, that's right. Right, and I think right. if we understand and if we keep asking ourselves this question, right? So who is it not safe for to step out into the sidewalk today, right? Right. Step out fully as who they are into this onto the sidewalk. Right. Um, yeah, I was just I was thinking about when you were saying about we are just part of this liberation movement. We're part of dismantling this. In uh, the the, um, the resource was dismantling racism, right? Yeah. Right. And I think one of the things that, uh, one of the um, the points there was uh, speaking. You know, how do we dismantle whiteness? And the one point was like, well, you're just part of how you know how to be an anti-racist. You're just part of a movement of liberation. Don't think that your life is going to be, you know, like you're going to make this, and just make this big difference. Understand that you are one person in this movement and that will take time. So I hear you echoing that. I'm like, yeah, okay, let's, you know, we add our voices. We add. By so let's let go of this guilt. Yeah. Right. You know what does not help us? Guilt. White guilt does not help us on any level. It doesn't help anybody. Um, 
you know, I was listening to this great podcast. Um, uh, if folks are interested, it is called um, Seeing White. And you can Google Seeing it. Seeing White. Seeing White. Yeah. And it's a, it's a series of podcasts around how whiteness was built. Uh-huh. And whiteness was built literally just so there was something that could be against blackness and slavery. So before, you know, the Portuguese made their way to um, Western Africa, there was no whiteness. There were no white people. And it was literally in building out the system of slavery, which was made totally because we needed a consistent labor market. That's, that's why it came to be. That whiteness was, was born. And whiteness was born to protect the system. And so this is a great series that really talks about how the systems and laws have come to be created um, to uphold the power of whiteness and white men. Like, with the founding fathers of this country, they literally spent time defining in Virginia what a white man was because a white man could get property. So they spent all this time literally defining what a white man was so that then they had it on the books of who could own property. So knowing that whiteness was literally created as a, as a means of anti-blackness um, is something that people should know and should understand just how insidious and deep it goes. And it wasn't anything that you created, right? This happened hundreds of years be- yeah, right? you know, before us. I, you know, I was, I was even, so you're talking about that, how whiteness was created. And I was reading Willie Jennings' book, The Christian Imagination. Mm-hmm. He talks about the origins of race and it rocks me because he, t- he tells that story right and it's like well it didn't exist before it's a, right it was created it's a creation right it's a construct it's, it's self- a construct it's a construct with political and social consequences and economic right and all oh, economics right and so um i posted something on facebook yesterday because i've been doing some reading around um the first kind of um, right. And, and, and anti-blackness really came from, not from these scholars, but really from these Portuguese ship um, from the captains, trade. right, ship tra- uh, traders who were trying to justify making the money of how they were making it. And so one of the most famous ones in Portugal kind of put out some language around how um, um, West Africans were, you know, barbaric and all these other things. And in saying that, um, then got, um, I can't think of his name, the, the leader, the king of Portugal was um, the navigator, something was, was his name. Henry? Yeah, yeah. And then the Pope wrote the papal papers, and in those papal papers, um, Pope Nicholas wrote, and I'm going to actually read you the words from the papal papers because they're really powerful. Um, The papal wrote a mandate to the Portuguese king and instructed him to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue, right, all of these West Africans and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors, the kingdoms, dukedoms, counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and to convert them to his or her and their use and profit. So the mission from day one has always been about vanquishing, exploiting, and destroying Africans, blackness, 
for capitalism and profit. And that mission has never faltered and has never changed because then we codified that mission with laws and systems and institutions that upheld it. Yeah. So this is not by accident. Oh, it's so sobering to, you know, it's just, oh. <laughs> So we can, we can be, and, and it's, right, so it's internal and external work, right? I can be in relationship with you, my sister, and be in deep communion and, and loving relationship with you, and that will never stop this system from moving forward. So, you know, people are like, let's just hang out together. If we hang out together more, if we, you know, if we drink a beer together, if we do all these things together, then that will change it. It won't. Right. You can have a racist system. Uh, this is one of the things that was said on the podcast. You can have the racist system without racist because that it runs on its own. So unless we dismantle the system. So unless you dismantle the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we have lots of work to do. Get to, let's get to work and that's what i say all the time let's go get this freedom let's, let's go get free and let's get free together yeah oh, yes. okay. because as we do this external work all of our internal work our internal oppressions the ways that we don't love ourselves and loves other people is shown to us that is revealed to us in this work that's why i'm like we got to get free together i just can't be over here doing this work and you're sitting over there not doing it yeah, it doesn't right. work that way. Right. Yeah, no, and I and I absolutely coming from the story that I come from, I I can say a big yes to that, right? How we exactly, are, you know, right? Yeah, absolutely. How we're connected to each other, and I love what you're talking about the internal work and the external work. It's also connected, right? As we address the externals, the internals also become free. It's like, oh, oh. we're oh. we're sitting in so much trauma. Right? There's so much trauma that we just swim in every day. And so we have to do our internal and external work. Okay, so talk, let's talk a little bit about self care. Right? I think as a dangerous woman, you also, it's very important for us to know how to do that. And we aren't socialized to know how to do that. So tell me, what do you do? What, what brings you joy? I don't do enough. I have to be honest. I work all the time and I love, I work cause I love it, yeah. but I'm also on all the time and I don't renew myself in ways that I should. So one thing that I do without fail is I go on vacation twice a year. I, I don't, I do not care. Um, and, um, I usually try to actually to get back to the continent because it's one of the places I love. So last year, I went to the Seychelles, which I'd never been to, and I laid on the beach for a week, and it was the best thing that ever happened in my life. Um, and next week, I am going to a beach, and I'm laying around a beach, I'm laying around a pool for a week. So for me, um, it's disconnecting and being around bodies of water, and I don't disconnect well, so I literally have to send myself on the other side of the world so that I disconnect. It's a very intentional, yeah. <laughs> right? I'm like, I have to put myself in like crazy different time zones and all so that I will disconnect. So, um, so I do that, but I, I also have a great group of women in my life that support me and love me and that help to take care of me. Mm -hmm. And in the things that, you know, being around my children and loving up on them and watching them become these amazing adults mm -hmm. for me has been really a great privilege. And it's, and I'm not one of these mothers who's like, Oh, I never want my kids to grow up. I was really happy when my kids grew up. Um, <laughs> I was really happy when they became adults, but it's just watching them blossom in ways that I didn't because they feel more freer than I did. Right. Or they feel like, um, they got their voice long before I got mine. And that's been really, for me, a joy to watch when I see young women, young brown and black women who, yeah, just have these amazing voices and are really strong and, and joyful in how they live. That, that 
for me makes me just feel like okay this this is happening this is the work and this is that this is one of the great outcomes from that work so um i'm not a let's get a pedicure and a manicure woman <laughs> I love good food and I love good people and I surround myself with those things because they bring me joy. So the other day I said I wanted to eat french fries, but I ate a cucumber salad instead. I love cucumber salad, so I ate the salad and then I ate the french fries because I wanted the french fries. And I deserve pleasure. We all deserve pleasure and joy in our lives. Mm -hmm. Whatever those things are, right. we deserve more of them. Yeah, just to be clear about what is it that brings us joy, right? Hey, right, what is it? And, and, and don't deny yourself the things that bring you joy. Don't do that. You know, this whole living our lives around shoulds and woulds. Mm -hmm. um, let's live around desires and wants and, and, and love. And, that sounds, yeah. like a, that sounds like a good future to me, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's what I want. That's what I want. <laughs> okay, so just to, to our last, my last question for you is this. Um, you talked about Audre Lorde, but if you can tell me a, a book that has transformed you, that is a dangerous book in your world for you, what would that be? Audre Lorde. Mm -hmm. The Sister Outsider Essays and Speeches. I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, it's all of her writings. It is all of, her, uh, you know, she has this one poem in there called, um, the black unicorn. And there's lots of things she talks about in that poem, but the line that, um, has always stayed with me is she talks about, um, you know, when the sun is setting, we're afraid that it may not rise in the morning. And uh, when our stomachs are full, we're afraid of indigestion. And then when our stomachs are empty, we're afraid we won't eat again. And uh, when we are loved, we're afraid that love will vanish. And when we're alone, we're afraid that we'll never have love. And when we speak, we're afraid that we won't be heard nor welcomed. But when we're silent, we're afraid. And what she says is, so it's better to speak knowing we were never meant to survive. So it's being present, right? When I'm loved to be in that moment and be loved, and when it's gone, to know that it's coming back again. And um, yeah, and that it's better to speak. It's always better to speak. Mm. Okay, so one last one, and this is, I mean, maybe you said it already, but maybe just two in one. What is one thing you hope the world would know? I'm so, I didn't hear the question. What is one, one thing you hope the world would know? Mm. That that until all of us are free, none of us are free. And I mean that globally, right? Mm -hmm. Till women in Haiti have what they want, what they need and what they want for their lives, until women in Rwanda mm -hmm. have what they need and want in their lives, until women in Detroit have what they need and want in their lives, none of us have anything. Amen. Yeah. And I'm with you. Yeah, we're all connected. And my freedom, shouldn't come at the expense of anybody else's, right? And it's all connected. Until I'm, until we're all free, none of us are free. So. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your work in the world, thank you for your voice in the world. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for who you are. And I uh, thank you for creating She Loves and your community and all the beauty that you bring to the world. Um, yeah. It's good knowing that y'all are there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ah, I love you. And I love you. <laughs> have a wonderful day, my friend. You too. Bye-bye, hon. Bye-bye.